Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first mic at the new Bookstore One Sarasota. The way this will work is that we have the three poets with us today. I'm going to introduce them, and then each of them will come and give a reading for 15 minutes. And then once that's through, we'll have some time for a QA and a and a little bit of a discussion. So without further ado, the first poet that you're going to hear from is Pat Owen. So Pat's work has appeared in Gulfstream Literary Magazine, Louisville Review, as well as in several anthologies. She was a finalist in the Atlantic Review International Poetry Competition. Her debut poetry collection, Crossing the Sky Bridge, was published in 2016. Her second collection, Orion's Belt at the End of the Drive, was published in 2019. The second poet in your front is Lauren Udwari. Lauren started writing poetry in 2020 as a way to cope with a world and a time in her life that felt careless. She's a tech startup marketing leader who daydreams of writing poems and exploring the country by camper van. Inspired by the delight and distress of humanity and nature, she writes to process mercurial emotions and connect with others over shared but often silenced experiences. She's a mother, ultra runner, and vegan for the planet. The final reading will be from Carla Lynn Merrifield, a nine-time Pushcart Prize nominee and National Park Artist in Residence. Carla's had more than 1,000 poems appear in dozens of journals and anthologies and has 15 books to her name. Her Godwit Poems of Canada received an Eisman Award for Poetry. She's a frequent contributor to the Songs of Arrette's Poetry Review, an assistant editor and poetry book reviewer for the Centrifugal Eye. She's a member of Just Poets, the Florida State Poetry Society, the New Mexico Poetry Society, the I'm the Author's Guild. Following her 2018 Psyche Scroll is the 2019 full-length book, At the Baskin Fractal, Poems of the Far North. She's currently at work on a poetry collection, My Body, the Guitar, inspired by famous guitarists and their guitars. So now, Pat, I'll let you take your <laughs> I feel like I just died and went to heaven. <laughs> my friends from all parts of my life have come, and I'm so grateful. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Georgia, for making this happen. And here, all here. For poetry. The good news, bad news is um, the bookstore one has stopped. Uh, two of my most recent books, this is the newest one and the last one, Orion's Belt at the End of the Drive, but they just sold out just now. Uh -huh. So uh, they're happy to order order them for you if you'd like. This is the latest one in Orion's Belt at the end of the drive. So one if you want. The first song is called Music. It's about my father. And if you had asked me in any part of my life if my father and I were close, I would have said no. But strangely, all these poems have come to me recently about my father, and I'm finally able to acknowledge the formative influence he had on my life. This one's called Music. It's what my frail free childhood needed like oxygen, and it's what my father tried to provide. For breakfast, marching music on the radio. He was always whistling under his breath, an upright piano in the living room, and to tempt me with more lessons, musicians appeared in our home. With trumpets displayed in a felt case, an accordion we could try out. And then there was the clarinet we borrowed from the school band. All these luxuries his farm childhood couldn't afford, but now for us the best, all stabs at nudging us out of the great mundane and into the exalted above. And even now, hearing chords of piano music, an ancient pang of guilt that I didn't fulfill his dream. I wish I could be for him a marching band, tubas flashing in sunlight, the rat-a-tat-tat of drums. This poem is called The Amaryllis. The backstory is uh, every year around Christmas, I give my two daughters
pink and hopeful on my breakfast table. Have any of you ever had a pet that was like a part of your family? <laughs> this poem is called Saxon. You were nothing but a pup when you came to us. Kinky Airedale fur drew hands to your lion head for a cuddle caress. Not that you'd hold still, but frisking, scampering away. You knew we were untrained as you, <laughs> leaving you in the laundry room all day with only a radio playing. We came home to find you trapped behind the dryer, chewing through electrical cords. Your manners never improved much. Your visitors startled by your muscular body curling at them as they enter, massive paws on their shoulders. We settled on leashing you to a bookcase when guests were expected. Your brute strength could have toppled the books, but you felt contained, and so were. All the years walking the neighborhood, you straining the leash, pulling me along. Neighbors saying, who's walking who? And the last trip to the vet where it took two of us to carry you to the car. And on our way, the sweet smell erupting, your spirit leaving. And the next day, be lying on the rough hemp carpet, weeping the empty house. Have you ever moved into a new house and you try to sense who was there before, what kind of spirits are still around? Are the ghosts of those people still there? And how do you make it your own? This is called the new house. In the attic, I found dusty, tied with string, packets of letters between husband and wife. The wife fleeing Kentucky winters for Florida skies. Husband home tending the family salvage business. His days in spare parts. The junkyard rusty and cluttered. The harshness of his gray world contrasted with hers, bright and sun-drenched. I read the letters one by one, furtive, almost glancing over my shoulder. Words intimate in blue ink, as individual and personal as a fingerprint. I breathed their breath as I read, their lives spilled out line by line. I could almost smell them. She felt guilty to be away, grateful. He attempted cheer, looking forward to her return. Speaking of the daffodils in bloom, maybe she'll come home sooner. By the last word of the last letter, I merged with these ghosts, my closest companions, who once lived in these rooms, who painted the walls a cozy brown. I weighed trying to return the letters to their children if I could find them, but that would mean revealing my guilt. Honoring their intention to preserve, I returned the letters to their spot in the attic where I imagine they still glow with a soft light. <laughs> Does anybody still have a, a, an address book? Address book. This is called, this is called a dress book. It's traveled so many miles, threadbare corners, alphabetical tabs frayed and curling, water stains on the stitched burgundy front, post-it notes on the inside cover, contact info for Jane, now in assisted living, instructions for getting messages from my old landline, entry code for the building, appliance repair references, always trying to help my future self. Lines crossed out with new addresses, couples no longer together, an astrologer, my favorite florist, the poet whose husband tragically died, my neighbor two moves ago, a couple from the movie class, therapist of an old girlfriend. You wince at the sight of estranged friends. You scratch out the names of people now dead, 
a catalog of markings in careful blue ink, petroglyphs even now fading. How do you feel when somebody calls you honey? <laughs> <laughs> this poem is called Honey. <laughs> the richly nuanced American word honey means more than the yellow sticky stuff for your toast. It follows more coffee in the diner. It can be touching or demeaning, depending on who says it. Condescending from an older man, intending to put you down or a genuine term of endearment, uh, or a genuine sign of affection, grandmother to child, a term of endearment between lovers, as comforting as a tender laying on of hands. It finds a compatible home in the South where it seems to thrive in the humid air, as natural as a Southern draw. <laughs> Do any of you have parents or children? And do you know something about intergenerational stuff? <laughs> this poem is called, So Much Pain We Inflict by Being Who We Are. She could never please her mother, who was after all French and had her standards. No matter how hard the American daughter tried, her facial structure would never allow her to sound truly French. She spent a lifetime trying to understand why she wasn't worthy of love. Rocks rubbing against rocks. They say each generation is an overreaction to the last one. Inevitable bruising in this pendulum swing heads knocking against heads. I heard a priest say, be quick to forgive unintended consequences. We've just come out, I hope, of the COVID era, era and uh, we're trying to figure out how to move on uh, from here. This was written last year on my screen porch when all my uh, in Kentucky when all my grandchildren were taking off for travels everywhere and I hadn't been any distance for since the beginning of COVID. It's called leaving. It's better to be the lever than the left. More green shoots of new growth. Remembering my wedding dress hanging on my bedroom door me departing into my new life, the emptiness of the left behind. I haven't had much experience as the left behind, always being the one to leave, cutting all ties, getting in the car and gone. Triptych maps beside me on the seat. This is the slant I choose to savor. Now the young are flying off, winging into new vistas, and I find myself on the Porch, staring out on an almost dead tree. Just today, a hawk swept down into the yard, lingered a few moments, and then soared away. I still hear it calling to me from the high trees. The song is playing in my head. To breathe, you must leave. Have any of you ever lost anything <laughs> and you think you go into panic mode and think your life will not be able to go on without this missing project? This poem is called, When I Think I Have a Problem, I Generally Don't. <laughs> this was the day of the lost earring. My favorites I've worn every day for a decade. Silver beaten disc from Oaxaca which I've prized like their breath itself. Last night, one fell off the table and no amount of feeling under the bed turned up anything but dust. 
During the night, reliving Ellen's irretrievably lost Mickey Moto ring bouncing on the kitchen floor. I feared this too, like Ellen and her ring, would be forever gone. After my all night restless plotting how to replace it, next morning, lugging the heavy terracotta lamp and emptying and scooting the Mexican table, down on hands and knees, sliding my palm over layers of lint. There it was, glowing like a treasure. And the last poem in the book is about my daughter, but also about generational stuff. What, what do we owe? What do we owe generations? And how does that play out? Hawks. My daughter thinks hawks are loved ones come back to protect her. And who knows? Maybe someday I'll be soaring high above the tall trees looking down. But today we're walking together in the park. And as we pass the glistening magnolia and holly trees, I do not say, that's what I wanted to plant for the twins until the idea was vetoed as too messy. And I feel good about holding back not treading on hurtful ground, practicing for next time and for the time after that. Until I grow closer to the goodness, I can only imagine. my first reading so you'll have to bear with me <laughs> this is a new experience um this one's called trying to make it i have blisters on my wrists i'd call them calluses if they weren't so fresh forever without time to heal and i wonder if this is sort of like being a couple whose shell is covered in limpets a consequence of being alive i also have a stiff neck from the second monitor and tight hips from sitting i will do this for half and I wonder if I share these pains with the great heron who cranes its neck and holds still to eat, or with the alligator who spends half its life waiting for prey with its mouth open. I sit, type, stare, while bivalves carry their limpets, and great herons and American alligators hunt by staying still, all of us just trying to make it. This is called tissue paper skin. May I ask you a question? Could you tip the mic up a little bit so we can hear you better? Thank you. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Tissue paper skin and veins that look like the Nile. You've proven something, that endurance didn't break you. Your sleeping face hides eyes like San Francisco fog and your collarbone wants to break through. I want to slide like you did, down but not out, raging but with grace, not toward death but with it. You did your time as well as it did you and your old friends now, laughing and crying to pass what little is left. You see things better now that you're nearly blind and don't need to move to feel moved. I'm watching you, old man, like one studies a map before entering the wild. My greatest work was you. I wanted something special and you wrapped it in an old map of my favorite city. I wanted a neatly handwritten letter and you used the finest ink and sealed it with fancy wax. I wanted you to say that you loved the ugliest parts of me, and you did. I spent my whole life building this body with a solid foundation, sturdy walls, and a new roof every so often. And you leveled it, took a jackhammer to the floor, and set the walls on fire. You knew I wanted two things, your love and my story, and that I couldn't have both. So you took your fine pen, crossed out every line of my fiction, and made me see that my greatest work was you. My body is your refuge. Who needs a weighted blanket when I have all of you keeping all of me from floating away? My sound machine heart mourns the day your body stops taking refuge on mine. Remember our synchronized bellies? You'd breathe in and I'd let everything go. It never felt like sacrifice. Around the corner is time sneaking up on us and soon your body will outgrow my motherly mattress. You will tether others, and my soul will long for the heft of yours. 
Rebel cassette tapes. Do you remember Rebel cassette tapes and the way tiny plastic teeth felt around your teenage finger in the schools? Do you remember your room without blue light and just a boom box and no way to reach a friend but through a landline? Do you remember AOL usernames, Oregon Trail video games? We were dying from dysentery, but the World Wide Web was coming for us just the same. <laughs> to all the mothers, uh, am I allowed to use profanity? I hope you do. Okay. It makes it more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> to all the mothers out there with babies in their bellies, on their backs, in their laps, or even worse, gone, or never here. To all the mothers out there who want to love their bodies but can't, won't, wouldn't, never could, shouldn't, we didn't stand a chance, did we? Like asking a scoop of mint chocolate chip to stop melting in goddamn motherfucking July. <laughs> to all the working mothers out there trying to make it in a world that wasn't made for us. I know what it's like to pump in a dirty ass break room to be told my place is in the home, to be told I look nice in that dress, to be told not to wear that dress, to be told I'm too nice, not nice enough, working too hard, but not hard enough. To all the mothers in their bodies and the work they must do to somehow love ourselves in a world that begs us not to. Oh. <laughs> this is a little softer. Um, <laughs> friends like feathers. Friends like feathers, some magnificent, some plain, some plucked, some fallen, all of you treasures. I've always been a collector. There isn't a feather I don't want. It's a thrill to find part of an eagle's wing or pastoral's tail on a suburban lawn, a city sidewalk, a million passers-by, and I'm the one who noticed you. This is all I want with you, to admire and keep you, all together in an empty beer bottle on my windowsill. I don't need to organize you. I just want to know that you're mine. Fun fact, who are you? Short bio, please. Fun fact, tell me about yourself. What do you do? What are some of your favorite fucking things? <laughs> Introductions, icebreakers, how are you still a fan of humidity after a lifetime of questions like these? What do you do when asked to distill 21 million minutes into one paragraph, 200 words or less, boil yourself down to a sound bite? Why not, what small thing brings you joy? Who do you admire? What do you value? How do you like to spend time? More inquiries like this, please. Make us feel like flowers you want to grow, not things to cut and show. I enjoy sipping coffee in the sunshine. I revere Georgia O'Keeffe. I value creativity, equity, and efficacy. I like to spend my time observing nature. How about you? Grief. There aren't many feelings bigger than love, but those who've known loss can name one. If lucky, your first meeting with her is a fiery touch, a campfire spark hitting cool skin. You'll either sit there watching, sensing the sizzle, or jump, wave, scream in awe of the painful near miss. When luck runs out, you'll get eaten alive by her. Great white jaws, crushing bones, ripping flesh. You will not get the luxury of a little taste with your face pressed into the buffet. You don't get to decide when you've had your fill. And while the burn from a tiny ember will heal, the relentless clamping down of a predatory jaw can last or cost a lifetime. So if someone tells you it was better to have loved and lost, it's because they haven't met her yet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Snoring bear. <laughs> My therapist asked me, what's the purpose of your life? And I asked to borrow hers because it's easier to take than make. But she didn't speak and the question sat with me and then on me like a little brown bear. I was warm under its matted fur. I was scared under its claws. I thought about people, no one in particular, just our collective experience. Age, loss, the way light filters through trees. I thought of our planet, monarchs migrating, rivers rising, all of it all of us fallen. I told my therapist, I don't know. And she nodded. I was getting warmer. Our session ended and the bear got up, slid under my bed and started snoring. <clears throat> Sandpiper eulogy. If I have to die and we all must, then my wish is to go this way. 
running or whatever it is that sea turtles do, as quickly as I can into the rising sun, into dawn, to the place that would buoy my body for a hundred years. If I have to, to die, then my wish is to go in a bed of seashells with a driftwood headstone and sandpipers singing a happy and unintentional eulogy, and I will have left nothing behind but impressions of my body in the sand. Like the swarrow. Like the swarrow, I took centuries to become, several lifetimes crammed into my one. Like the swarrow, I hide delicate bones, gentle ribs under sturdy skin, long arms reaching up. Like the swarrow, I have holes, empty places. A cactus wren may sleep in my belly. Like the saguaro, I am gripping to some and wholly unnoticed by many. Like the saguaro, I have symmetry in places and imbalance everywhere else. Like the saguaro, I am symbolic of a landscape just by being me. Like the saguaro, I want to belong and to be alone. Unraveling is the best part. The unraveling is the best part, but does require being whole at the start. It's dizzying to move like that, to spin out of control from a state so constrained. The first pull, a thrill, knowing what's to come, barreling into things you've yearned to see undone. Even unspooled, stretched, and spent, you are surrounded by evidence of the main event, and look at you, already wondering if you'll be able to pull yourself back together again. Of course you will. Collect yourself. And it will feel tedious and a little ridiculous because you'll do it as you dream about letting go again, casting yourself out as far as you can. I'll read one more because I read too fast. Um, I am the alley cat. I am the alley cat lurking, pretending not to notice the human strolling by with soft hands, acting like I'm not hungry, starving for touch. I'm the alley cat with scars, teeth that ache from crunching bones. Across the street is a beautiful cat, groomed. Her tail waves up and down when she sees me. She's intrigued by my dire state. It makes her grateful for her stoop and her people, beings that miss her. I am the alley cat. My best chance is a tourist, someone who hasn't seen me fuck things up. I've killed little birds, eaten moldy bread, fought to the death. She doesn't know me and stops at the trash bin to see me, too afraid to touch me, but she's talking to me. So I'm talking back. I can't help but purr. And her heart breaks until she crosses the street and the pretty cat meows and sits in her lap for a while, blinking her eyes at me, knowing that she couldn't survive without love, like I can. Like this. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Georgia, for having me back. When Georgia and I set up this uh, arrangement for today, she said to me, "You have to play your, you have to play your guitar." Yeah, just a little bit for a minute. Anyway, and I have never done this in public before. <laughs> Not for more than two people. <clears throat> so this is an experiment. You're my guinea pigs. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm a beginner. And the reason, I mean, I really am playing this besides George's entreaty is I, um, I bought the guitar and am learning how to play it in order to write the book. Because I thought if I'm going to write about guitarists, I better know a little bit more about what it's like to play one. So I'm going to read you a couple short pieces, play just a couple little things, and then finish with, with some real poetry. Anyway, <laughs> the first part of the book is called uh, Mere Moral, and that's me uh, trying to, to learn at my age uh, an instrument. Uh, so I'm going to read you a couple from Mere Mortal to start with. And this I wrote on the very first day I played the very first notes uh, on this gorgeous instrument. 
etude eight two. Posture. Sit forward on the sofa. Straighten your spine. Spread your legs. Let the instrument rest nestled on your right thigh. Uh, the next one is a tribute um, to my guitar teacher. I had two. I had one uh, before COVID. Um, during COVID, I had a different teacher. And now I'm back with my first teacher. And it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Whoops. I, wear, I have slippery clothes on this one. Um, anyway, this is called Etude. 131. No flags flying physiologically. Truth. Fingers do not contain muscles. Those minuscule goose bump pumping ones don't apply. Thus, my yet wimpy. La Man Sinistra grips owner's fretboard to place pressure on his ouch, newish six pack of strings as if for four digit yoga stretches. I am reaching in a practice exercise, developing dactyl tissue, reaching courtesy of foods in my palm, in my forearm, ably reaching through to tippy tips, capable of functioning independently in fibrous flexion and in which tendons to to adroitly abet my novice efforts. And oh, holy anatomy, the langeal osseous matter, bones at the very end of my instrumental body. Find you and me seeking these precision movements in space and time, in this space, this time. Okay, and I have to sit down for this. I can't play standing up. Um, yet. Um, so I'm going to do two little tiny pieces I call tonal poems, and they're very short poems that I put to music. You should, I, everybody hear me in the back? Yes. Okay. Um, so here's one. It's called Scripture, and this one is in the, in the book. Um, and it's the first one I wrote in December 2019. I read a text from a friend and I had my guitar in my lap and all of a sudden it became this. I wish I could stop over, say hi, spend the night talking with you. Hey, I miss you a lot. The rest of these, and I've done over 20 of them now, happen to be all haiku that I've said to music, which is kind of fun to take 13 syllables and make something out of it. So during COVID, uh, I did this one uh, and recorded it and said to all my friends in the United Kingdom, um, to uh, kind of my Christmas message to them which that year mm -hmm. in 2020. And it's called The Life of a Note and The Life of a, of a Chord. Um, and my teacher, my interim teacher uh, during COVID, who is British, uh, said just pay attention to how long the tone in a note can take uh, and the same thing with the cord. How long can a cord hang in the air? Um, and this little thing came out of it. Maybe. 
You know, you have to you learn this thing, you try to learn it. Um, and there's the rhythm part where you played all the chords, and then there's the melody part. So I'm gonna play, I think probably just about everybody will recognize this song. Uh, and I promise not to sing it. Um, I'm just gonna play it, but I'm gonna play the rhythm first um, and see if maybe a hand or two will go up that you think you know what song it is. See if I can do this. Uh, it's a waltz. Heroes. So these are people in my life who I know personally who are guitarists and, and who have uh, inspired me uh, over, the, over the years and certainly inspired me since I got uh, cranking on this uh, <clears throat> in this new journey. Uh, and here's, here's the first one in that section. And the poem itself dates to 1976. So I kind of been on this journey for a while. I just didn't know it. It's called Pretty Polly in Trafalgar. It was night and it was warm. The sky was ready for a storm. The moon was not so bright, but neither was the candlelight for the cafe crowd who came down Main to Fillmore to watch the music made at the coffee house Trafalgar. A big man they called Big Jerome appeared upon the stage in his wire rims, his southern brawl, his tales of troubles he had known. He played to earn his nightly wage in the smoky music hall, singing for the rich man, playing for the poor at the downstairs room at old Trafalgar. He sang for me and Polly, stroked the six string with a shiny silver slide. He was sitting on a bar stool, beating rhythms, changing time. Some of Havens he would sing with Jester Dillon by his side. He did ragtime, jazz, and syncopated rhymes. He even cut a record long ago and once before, but he never sang so pretty as he did at old Trafamador. 
God bless the father of that singing child. God bless the tree that lent the guitar wood and the tortoise for his shell and the finger pick that strummed so wide, wild, making music go oh so well. Trees pleasing pretty Polly in the crowd till they broke applause and asked for more, just sitting around in the basement at Trophalmador. But that was long ago and far away in a dark and distant buffalo. Since then, the sky has given into gray. The sun looks traded in for snow. I fear the cold. I fear the winter all so bold. I wish that things were like before. I wish that me and Polly could be listening to Big Jerome at the coffee house, Trout Family Door. Um, believe it or not, this was okay. This took place, and I wrote it in '76. The Trafalgar Door still exists wow. in Buffalo, New York. It's just a different address. Cool. Um, and this one is for my brother, who was a fabulous guitarist um, and singer and performer. Um, and I very, very, very humbly follow in his footsteps. It's called At 17. Who was that cute boy? My brother as clean cut teen with a folk guitar, beardless chin to the mic in the Franklin gym. Who was my brother then senior year with Gene in the middle full throated and Pete nonchalant on his banjo? They were doing Tom Dooley or All My Trials. Something Kingston Trio, something earliest Dylan, P, P, and M number. The photograph, <clears throat> 1964 vintage, a high school, <clears throat> excuse me, a high school Kodak moment depicts my brother emerging from the robin's egg of innocence, pre-Vietnam, pre-wine, pre-long life of broken women. The composition is such, there's no telling the truth, but I like to believe his audience danced. Classmates sang along that December night for Jimmy's sake. And then the third part is, uh, so we have mere mortal, local heroes and then mighty gods. And this is where you find uh, all the really famous guitarists. Not all of them. They'll, they'll be in a sequel a few years from now. Um, and I'm going to read this one uh, because probably no guitarist in American history has been more <clears throat> instrumental uh, in inspiring uh, guitarists through the decades since the 1930s. Um, Robert Johnson, um, most people kind of, oh yeah, he was a guitarist way back when, uh, and he sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads, and that was always the legend. Uh, such was not the case, but, uh, so this is my tribute uh, to Robert Johnson. It's called mm -hmm. Elemental Magic. Oh, ye mighty juke joints of the cotton fried Delta blues, Attend this jiving poem and guard these syncopated lines by the air that is his breath. And in the name of Robert Johnson, may I write. Oh, ye mighty fine lover boy of red hot triple rifflet mamas, attend these randy playing stanzas and guard these lust spoke words by the fire in his body and in the name of Robert Johnson. May I see. Oh, ye mighty midnight of crossroads of hoodoo and juju, attend these incantationally licked lyrics and guard their fully fretboarded, haunted syllables. By the tears of his primal woman-tempted heart, and in the name of Robert Johnson, May I spin my web. 
oh ye mighty rambling meat barreling bottleneck boogie ox and urgency attend these peculiar tunings and guard this outlet runes symbolic by the grit of his dirt road dirt farm mudline spirit and in the name of robert johnson may i dream our devil's music <laughs> um, there are two guitarists in here who hailed uh, from, from Florida. Um, the one called uh, for Jacko Pastorius, who was probably the greatest bass player who ever lived uh, from uh, Fort Lauderdale. That's too long for today. So I'll give you this one. Tom Petty's six triplets. You saw through me to the blue frontier, Tom Petty. I am a fortunate woman. You got my butt and thighs moving in the condo kitchen on the lanai just when I needed a dirty dancing <laughs> fix. I am the fortunate woman falling in love with another dead genius you from Gainesville with me here down the road in southern COVID land wandering metaphysically in election purgatory but following your heartland country blues rock and roll from you in the beyond to laptop YouTube to Alexa machine to my ears into my mind, entering into my body, you and your slew of brick markers. So, no, no, Tom, I won't back down on my Stratocaster. Never, ever, nor back down, Tom, on my mark because I'm a fortunate woman who is always playing alone. And we'll wrap up with, uh, yeah, there's a lot of boys in here, but <laughs> the women are represented too. Um, so I'll, I'll end up with this one. Um, it's called Diptych, Left Hand, Third Finger. Uh, the Diptych is really, sorry, uh, two poems that are kind of linked together um, uh, in, a, in a short sequence. Uh, and left hand, third finger is in honor of uh, the guitarist who <clears throat> plays with a slide on her third finger up and down the floor. Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonnie. Bonnie, I am your old woman. I have turned down those lights and I am scared to run out of time, but not yet ready to give up this fight. Bonnie, you can blue slay demons and keening banshees to set me fairies free. And the 12 bars nimbly play me this lesson. Bonnie, please sing our very nick of being along this hard way we go and still believing in this living by your voice. Good talk. Music, mighty precious. Mm -hmm. oh. Let's give all of them another. Your questions and start a bit of a discussion. So if you guys want to come stand up here so we can um, lean into the microphone. Anybody? Keeps your hand and start talking. Go ahead. Well, I just had a, it's just like, you know, picking up the guitar and sharing it with us as a beginning player. I, I admire your courage and, and the spirit behind it. And I just wanted to mention that you're probably very familiar with Joey Harjo, of 
course, the poet, and she picked up the saxophone later in life, and I didn't she know. plays all the time. So check mm -hmm. that out. Oh, I will really take <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know that about her. Yeah, it's very oh, cool. God, the saxophone. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I have a question for all of you based on one of your comments. What is something, some small thing that brings each of you joy? Well, while we're staying in tar mode, um, <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just sit and take notes and I just listen. Um, that, that instrument is so beautiful. I can find it. It's, it's a joy every day. Mm -hmm. I won't go on the floor. I'm warning tea. I'm warning wall. For me, it's that we have three generations here my mom and my daughter, and it's just so nice to be able to read them here. One of those great questions in your poem about the questions you wish you got more often. Let's do those. Oh, yeah. That was one of them. That, <laughs> that was, was one of them. Yes. Yes. What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Or go ahead. I have a, for, for everyone. Um, how long have you been writing poetry and were you inspired by a particular poet? Or what inspired you to? Uh, find their art and write them. Well, I think I wrote my first poem. My parents can probably back this up when I was like five or six. And then I took a long hiatus <laughs> um, based on the feedback I got. <laughs> um, but no, I, I only really started writing poetry um, since the start of the pandemic. Um, and I am very much inspired by Charles Bukowski and Mary Oliver, and they're both very different but similar in that they are relentless in their pursuit of truth um, and brutal honesty, which I just I really love and create. Started writing in 1998 when my partner was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. And I started writing as catharsis. And then over a period of time, I just got more serious about it. It's a craft. That was fun. Um, I was 11. Um, my mother gave me for my birthday a copy of the Diary of Anne Frank, which I devoured, vowed to her, Anne Frank, that I would keep a journal and that I began writing poetry in that journal. And I still, I'm still journeying, journaling. <laughs> Carla, what do you know about the trail from Buffalo? <laughs> well, I haven't been in a long, long time. Um, what was your association there? Oh, it was just a place. I'm from Buffalo. That's why. Okay, um, it was where you where you went. Um, I mean, I was in grad school at the time at UB, um, and you know, I think I was probably teaching a, at a fellowship. I was teaching a night course and. Tuesdays and Thursdays, we go to the trout. I still have my t-shirt from them, too. <laughs> it's kind of frail. What's your favorite poem you've ever read? What's your favorite poem you've ever read? No, written. Written, written. written or read? Written. 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 <laughs> what I did last night. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the one I haven't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> like choosing your favorite child. That's uh -huh. not anything else. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Carla, speaking of Buffalo, is Annie DeFranco in your guitar book? Mm -hmm. guitar no, book? she's on the list to be in the sequel. Okay, very good. Yep. Yes, thank you. Yes. Make a more concerted effort to get more females into the next It's hard because we can. And of course, Joni Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She too has two poems. The gods. <laughs> <laughs>
I can't hear you. Which of your books were from that this latest book, Art of Becoming? Thank you. Anything else? Okay. We'll give you the others. Um, so the Poetry Book Club meets here on Wednesday, April 13th from 2 to 3. Um, reading that was now, this is then poems by, I can have Doug, will you BJ say? BJ Sashadri. BJ Sashadri, correct? Yes. Cool. Um, and so if you haven't already, already RSVP'd for our Poetry Life event, um, you can check that out on our website. And that's set for Thursday, April 21st at 8 p.m. And poet activists Carolyn Forche and Padraig Otuama uh, will offer a critical reflection of uh, present day world with you know, censorship, and it'll be moderated by the journalist Charlene Hunter Bolt. Wow. Yeah, so that is April 13th, or sorry about that, April 21st at 8 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, what via, month? Month? Oh, via Zoom? It's via Zoom, oh. yep. Yeah, that's uh, all I've got. Thanks, guys, for coming. We should try to put